Thank you very much. Do I need a microphone or you can hear me without a microphone? What? We'll see. Mm -hmm. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I can't hear you. I don't have a hand to hold. <laughs> this is the problem and I have to move. Okay, let's try. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know how much you still have the strength to listen to a lecture. And uh, I'll try to do my best. Usually I will start with a joke to make you laugh, but with a broken rib, it's very hard to laugh, so I cannot do that. So we'll have to be serious. In addition, I'm on painkillers, and the time of their uh, influence is coming to an end. So I'll have to rush my lecture, but I'm glad to be here. And as you see, I have a lot of helpers here. I would have it without a broken rib, but for sure with a broken rib, everybody will do something here. So at first, I would like to begin by thanking the Northeastern section of the American Chemical Society for honoring me with the James Flack Norris Award for outstanding achievement in the teaching of chemistry. I would also like to thank all my students at Columbia College during the years who taught me all the methods <coughs> of teaching I developed, helping me move from traditional method of teaching to creative methods of learning. So all my students, where they are, I thank them because I wouldn't know to teach without them. And with that, I would like to tell you a little bit on how I arrived to Columbia. As you, you heard already so much, I don't know if I have anything to tell you about my teaching, but I did ice top effect at the Weizmann Institute, at the Technion, at Cornell, Northwestern, and uh, Etihad, the Etihad, the Swiss Polytechnicum. And in 1977, the president of Columbia College that had a vision, uh, he started this school in the 60s with 200 students, where he said it was a school that no parents heard about and every child on the street knew about. He came from a line of left-wing people that they were members of the Progressive Party and had a vision to start a school with an open admission so everybody that will still have a chance in life. We are not an open graduation, but we are an open admission. So if you have a diploma, a high school diploma, you can come in. He wanted to make it a place for people from the inner city, for minorities, that they were talented in the arts and would never be able to go to the art institute because they wouldn't have a portfolio to show in order to be admitted. He surrounded himself with the best of the brightest of the city of Chicago to teach there. They usually not only didn't get a salary, but they brought their own money to make the things going because the students for sure couldn't pay tuition. And today the school has more than 10,000 students the largest art school in the country, the largest independent college in the state of Illinois outside of the uh, comprehensive universities, where uh, Mike Alexander started it. It was in one floor in a rented building. Today we own, Woody, how many? 14. 14 buildings. We practically million. own all of the South Loop. <laughs> Chicago is our campus. It's a big one. And we have students from all over the world but the same philosophy and same vision still existed in the school. And when the school was accredited as a liberal arts <coughs> college, Mike decided that science has to be taught there. But he was so worried to bring suddenly science, you know, after the 60s into a place with creative artists and dancers and uh, poets and all that. So he sent a letter around the country that is looking for a scientist that is involved in arms control and disarmament and in human rights and in helping the minorities and helping the poor. And he distributed this letter among his colleagues. And the editor of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Ruth Adams, was a good friend of her. So she distributed it among the people that believed in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And my name came up, and Mike made me an offer to come and teach. 
to tell you, when I arrived the first time, they were in a rented place, and I came to the school, and I got dressed up like for an interview. And I sat there, I had an appointment with the dean, and I waited and waited and waited. And meanwhile, a very skinny guy with hair till here, long hair, with a beard, goatee beard, walked by, and I was sure that Jesus from the Last Supper stood here. <laughs> and I just started thinking, where did I arrive here? But following him was a beautiful big man, long white hair, white beard, white eyebrows, so impressive that if I would have to draw Moses, this is the only way. I so I said, this must be a very interesting place where Moses and Jesus are. <laughs> but by that, I started thinking, what am I still waiting? So the secretary kept on telling me the dean will come, the dean will come. Suddenly, the door opened, and a person with long hair, glasses with pink lenses, a purple shirt embroidered and a ring on every finger <laughs> opened the door and said, can I help you? And I said, I'm waiting for the dean, excuse me. And he said, I'm the dean. <laughs> and I said, oh. <laughs> and, <when he, laughs> and because everything was very fast, I had a resume with me. He said, did you bring your resume? I said, yes. Here is my resume. And he said, I'm sorry I was late because we all went for a retreat this weekend. Until that time, I knew about the Baptist going for a retreat. Yeah, Krishna, I never knew that universities go on retreat. In the 70s, it wasn't popular. I was sure I'm in a cult. But it has nothing to do with an academic institution. So I heard the story, and at the end of that, he said, we will be in touch with you. And I said, yes, for sure. And I took my resume, and he said, but we need your resume, and I said, to be honest with you, I cannot leave it here. <laughs> <laughs> and I took it away and went back to Evanston, where Northwestern was. No. Then he called me and said, eh, we would like you to come down for another interview, but this was just before I went for sabbatical to Switzerland. I said, you will have to pay a ticket. The date was 10 days after I was supposed to be there to fly me back to Switzerland, from Switzerland. <laughs> So he said, I'll call you back. He called me back, and he changed the day, and he said, we can come earlier. I said, listen, I'm very busy. If you and your people want to interview me, now you will come to Evanston. I'm sorry. This place, I'm not coming anymore. So the delegation came to Evanston. And since then, we started a long, long love affair. I could have never done what I did in any other place in the world. At first, I wouldn't have the experience to take students, grandmothers that were prisoners, that were drug addicts, abused child, drug addict, then drug dealer, spending time in prison, suddenly showing up at my class, I didn't know the history, being very scared, barely speaking, and I will get to how she stayed in my class, the students, but she just got her master's degree from Columbia College. So this is what teaching at Columbia College did for me a pleasure that I could not have had anywhere else. So I decided to come and teach there. And my first class that I offered, and remember it's 77. Today, every chemist is, he believes that they invented the method of teaching relevant to the student's life, relevant to the environment, chemistry in context, you know that. But this was 77 before all these inventors invented it. And I tried to offer a class called Chemistry in Daily Life. But what happened when every student had it on the registration card, and they came to their major departments, the faculty erased it and said, why do you have to know chemistry? I never took chemistry. Why should you take? After a few days of registration, I knew that I will not have a paycheck because nobody was taking my class. So I had to invent a way to get students into my class. And I'm an Israeli. We don't have, maybe now we have, but when I grew up, we did not have rules for drinking. If you were one year old and you were Orthodox, you drank on the Sabbath from the age of one. So I did not know that 
there is an age limit, and if I knew, I probably would have ignored it, so it didn't matter anyhow. I decided to bribe a group of students so they would take my class, Chemistry in Daily Life. So across the street was the Congress Hotel with a very nice bar with some salads down there. So I said, I'll take you all to have a drink on me. Come, let's go. So a group of them went with me, and they ordered drinks. And I started hearing a Bloody Mary, screwdriver, <laughs> and I said, my God, I thought I'm speaking English already, but I don't understand one word what they're saying. So I had to start to find out what it means. So when we sat down, I said to all of them, what are these weird words that we are talking? And they said, oh, this is orange juice and alcohol, and this is tomato juice and alcohol. So inspiration came, and I said, what is alcohol? And silence was there. And then they said, oh, it's something that makes you feel good. So I tried to explain to them everything about alcohol, and then everybody had the structure of ethanol on the napkin. By that stage, the whole bar attended this interesting <laughs> lecture. So I had all the bar, and I was so drunk with success, not with alcohol, <laughs> that I decided to continue. So for a little bit more money, I ordered salad with oil and vinegar for everybody, and the chemist among you know the end of the story. So I started asking, what is vinegar? They didn't know. I told them it's acetic acid. And the whole bar had a structure of acetic acid on their napkin. And by that stage, I told them that uh, uh, ethanol and acetic acid can react with each other. It gives ester, and sometimes you can use it as a nail polish remover. The whole bar was so shocked that now they swallowed the nail polish remover. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to calm them down and say, no, you need a catalyst, but by that stage it was already three, four hours that we were there. So I said to the ones that registered and paid tuition to go to Columbia College, if you take my chemistry and daily life class, the semester is 15 weeks. You have only 14 more to go because you already had your first chemistry. <laughs> and this is how I got my first class. I did not need to bribe after that because I got the students easier. But this taught me a lot of lessons that if you make a subject relevant to the student's life, to the student's interest, you can teach them everything you want. Even secondary ice stop effect, what I spend a lot of years to do. And all my methods of teaching started being adjusted to the way the students could learn. Now, after teaching, there is another important thing, and this is assessing students. I had to develop different assessment methods in order to adjust to different teaching methods. And we will go with that and see, Jeff, that saturation comes. So put the Okay. First thing I did with my students is I told them that because they probably are not used to have a science class and used to draw or to dance, if they feel saturated with me, all what they have to do is raise the sign saturated and I will shut up and take a break. And this was our agreement. But the, for them to understand what I'm saying, I show them immediately a beaker, and you know, ask the regular question, what I have, they said water, I said that we came to this clear liquid. But anyhow, to make a long story short, you sit here for a very long time already, what I told them is to add sugar to the beaker, and you know, the sugar dissolved, I explained to them that this is when they still can get what I'm teaching, and then we got to a saturated solution where the sugar uh, was in the bottom. So I said, this is when you cannot listen to me anymore, so there is no point for me to talk, there, like there is no point to put more sugar. Meanwhile, I was telling them everything about the solution and, and the, the dissolving of the sugar. And then I told them, but if you will put, and here you see a few Chicago teachers doing this experiment, if you put it on a hot plate, what is happening? The sugar dissolves, so then I asked them, so if I raise the temperature in the room where you are saturated, do you think you can absorb more? So then there was a big laughter, and they told me they will fall asleep. 
So I said to them, this is where the correlation doesn't apply anymore, but I finished to teach everything I wanted of saturated solution. And then they all put the stick in and they got the rock candy where we really crystallized. So this is how I could explain to them these subjects that I wanted. And I must say that they never abuse the fact that they can raise the sun saturated to let me know that they cannot uh, listen anymore. The next thing in order to show them that what I do is relevant is I start every class, and the whole Science Institute is doing it now, by telling the students to bring an article from the daily newspaper from where they want that somehow is relevant to what we are talking, if it's on the environment or energy. And for that, there are a few purposes. It's the next one, but I, let me just point out. All my slides were done by my students, so I want you to know nothing that you see is my creativity. So you see, we have times because we have English-speaking students, we have the La Raza for the Spanish-speaking students, and we have Iton Haaretz, that is an Israeli uh, newspaper that they copied it in order to do it. Jeff, you probably see that, that's right. Now, what is the purpose of that, of starting with a newspaper? It shows the students that they need a science background to really understand even the simplest article in a daily newspaper. It shows them that science is part of everyday life. It uh, tells them how it is important to communicate science accurately, and it gets them into the habit to look for science articles in the magazine. So this is what we do with each of our classes. Okay, thank you. Now, when I was in school, there was one thing I hated for all the stages, and it's writing tests. I resented it so much that in one hour, it doesn't matter how I feel, even if I have a broken <coughs> rib and a rotator cuff tear, and bronchitis, those are the three things I have now, I still have to be as brilliant to show that I really deserve an A. So I always hated it, and I promised myself that if I'll ever teach, I will not do it to my students. <laughs> but what I like to quote is my Rabbi Hillel, that somebody came to him and said, can you teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot? And the uh, distinguished rabbi answered, what is hateful to you, do not do unto your friend. And that is the whole Torah, the rest is only commentary. I remember it this very well, and my students are my friends. So I promise not to do to them what I hated that was done to me. Therefore, they can show their knowledge in any way they want. They don't have just to write a multiple choice test. And what they do, they can pick up their major, their hobbies, and uh, do the project. And the project they, on the subject, let's say we discuss the chemical bond, and we discuss the depletion of the ozone layer, they can pick up the media they want. The addition <laughs> benefit to that, additional benefit, that the whole class is part of the evaluation project, not just the teacher. So the student cannot come and say that I did such a wonderful job that deserves a day and I got suddenly a D. The whole class is part of watching the projects, if it's a song, if it's a dance, and evaluating the, the project. <coughs> the students love it. They spend a lot of time making these uh, projects. And many of them use it in their portfolios when they go to look for a job. <coughs> and the statistics shows that really the students that take the classes in the Science Institute and have a very good portfolio that get really e an easy time to get a job. I, don't, I want to tell you that I have a few students that are now in a PhD program in organic chemistry. One of them got already a PhD in molecular biology. So few of them get interested enough in science that I'm so they graduate 
in music or in television, they continue into the field of science. So I'll show you a few examples. This is an art student that when we discuss the fission reaction, and usually I discuss it with the history around it, so sure enough, it starts first with Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann in 1939, uh, doing the first experiment in Germany, then I try to ask the students here, the year 1939 in Germany, means anything to them, so we go a little bit into history, so they can understand the context of all that. This is an art student that did a cartoon book for children on this subject, and you see here one page, and the cartoon is written in a way that the atom is a child that describes to the other children what happens to him when he's being split during the fission reaction. Another book was done by a group of art students on the same subject, where different art students use different art forms to communicate the same subject. Now, in order to really prove that the standards of the chemistry are very high, so you know in America everything is very good if it's Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. So because and my to bed Mike left sub two because my subcommittee on scientific freedom in human rights that I'm chairing for this 17 years and the members that are there for 17 years are Tom Spiro, that was the chairman of chemistry in Princeton, and Jack Shiner, that was the chairman of chemistry in Indiana. I suggested to them that, as Jim said, that equal access to science education is a human right that belong to all, that we should develop together a curriculum where we can show that we can offer it in three such diverse institutions from Columbia and art school, inner city, open admission to Indiana, a big state school in Princeton that is very selective. We developed this course, we titled it uh, From Ozone to Oil Spill, Chemistry, the Environment of New. The NSF supported us with a quarter of a million dollars. They called it their flagship project. And in order to prove that my students are as good as Princeton students, they fly every year for the last 10 years to Princeton, and we have a whole day joint symposium where the students show each other's project. And after a while, you don't know who are the Princeton students who are Columbia. They become like just one group. So the projects you saw before, this project is one of the projects, those are projects of the students that were in the class that went to Princeton. This is a project that I'm very proud of because it's an art student that did a project in our forensic chemistry class. And what she did is an artwork showing all what they had to do in the lab in order to solve a crime. And she did, and we have the lab to do it, so she did, they check body fluid, blood, fibers, fingerprints, DNA, uh, chemicals, drugs, here was an arson, a bullet, and the big eye has to put all the puzzle together. But I'm showing it to you in this format because this was on the cover of the bulletin of the Israel Chemical Society. So it combined two of my loves, Columbia College with the State of Israel together, and this is why I love this uh, poster. Okay. It's a multimedia presentation. I'm tired to talk, so you're going to see a video. And the video is Secretary of Education, Dick Riley, that had a program. Uh, it was a satellite uh, town meeting that went on through all the television. 20 million people viewed it. He asked me, I know him from Renaissance Weekend, so he asked me to send him two minutes of examples of our students or Chicago Public School or Chicago students uh, examples. So it's two minutes with different examples. Then I was in Chicago sitting in a dark room 
horrible to be on a television when you're not in the place. They could see me, I could not see them. So you will see only how they introduced me, but you will not hear what I say because I don't like how I look there. So you will not have the chance.